Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Brash, bald faced blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. I remember back in my very first podcast, it was uh, summer of last year, and I had no idea what I was, I'd never done an internet radio show before. I had 15 years in live radio on an FM station, but as far as doing radio over the internet, I had no idea, you know, and uh, I wanted to have a guest for my first show, so everybody's like, you should have Aaron Raw on, he's awesome. I had never heard of the guy. (laughs) I <laughs> just I was like, Aaron who? So I go to his YouTube channel and I start to watch the uh, the videos and I start to find out that, man, this guy's got a tremendous amount of content. Uh, and he presents it well and he's authoritative and he's and he doesn't come off as uber geeky. You know, a lot of a lot of the information presented by people who are pro science is very difficult to digest. It's like reading stereo instructions, but he was able to present it with authority and still keep you hooked. And so we did a great show together, a great time. And I had always promised that I was going to get Aaron back on the show to, uh, to go again. And I don't even really have much of a plan for it today. I mean, I've got a few notes. I've got a few things. I know we definitely want to talk about evolution, but I've got, uh, you know, kind of an open slate. I've got uh, some people on the switchboard. I've got a few messages in from uh, from our users. And Aaron Raw, are you with me on the air? Let me try again. Aaron, are you with me on the air? I thought so. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, so glad you're here. Okay. I call the show, Is Evolution a Fact? We're going to cover a lot of things. But lately especially i've been hearing the argument it's just a theory it's just a theory it's just a theory you can't prove it science is always changing why bother whatever science believes now it's not going to think in 50 years 50 years ago they thought they had the answers and now look at how much it has changed you can't trust science and this for them is especially true when it comes to evolution. And I know this is one of your fortes. It's one of your passions. It's got to drive you crazy when you hear it. What is your response when someone says evolution is not a fact? It's just a theory. Well, when I was a kid, I know the people would tell me that they're basing my belief system on uh, shaking sand and that you had to build your house on a good foundation. And little did I know that When they're telling me that I'm on shifting sand, they mean that I'm on rock-solid evidence that I can demonstrably prove. And the rock foundation that they had was their assertions of baseless and unsupported speculation and assumptions without merit. So they want to change, they want to change things up. They want to project their own faults onto their opponent. And they want to assume all the attributes of their opponent, and they want to create this illusion of equality that does not apply. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned recently, I mean, what you usually hear is uh, lines of equivocation, like, you know, when somebody will say, in, in, usually in one debate, you know, you'll have people say that, you know, evolution is a religion, uh, science relies on faith just like religion does, science is biased like religion is. And they'll, they'll make these admissions about how bad religion is and how bad faith and how dishonest faith is, but only when they're trying to project that, that fault onto their opponents. They'll say there's no evidence for evolutionary things, that, but, the, but there is evolution or there is evidence for creation. And then they start saying that reason or religion is reasonable, just like science is, or that religion can be confirmed empirically just like science is. And then, of course, they end up all the way on the other end of the scale by saying that creationism is scientific. What bothers me the most, I think, is we can never really know anything. 
It'll always change. And of course, I see that in science now as a plus. I see it not changing for the sake of change, but essentially whenever possible, whenever new evidence comes in, you improve the information. To me, that seems like a strength. I had a great article about evolution from Stephen Jay Gould. It was written in Discover in May of 1981. It's about five paragraphs, but I, I really wanted to bring it to the show. I really wanted to read it uh, to you because it he was always such a good communicator. Stephen Jay Gould was so good at um, articulating science, but also being passionate about it. He said, in the American vernacular, theory often means imperfect fact, part of a hierarchy of confidence running downhill from fact to theory to hypothesis to guess. Thus, the power of the creationist argument, evolution is only a theory. An intense debate now rages about many aspects of the theory. If evolution is worse than a fact, and scientists can't even make up their minds about the theory, then what confidence can we have in it? Indeed, President Reagan echoed this argument before an evangelical group in Dallas when he said, in what I devoutly hope was campaign rhetoric, well, it is a theory, it is a scientific theory only, and it has in recent years been challenged in the world of science that is not believed in the scientific community to be as infallible as it once was. Well, Evolution is a theory. It is also a fact. Stephen Jay Gould continues. And facts and theories are different things, not rungs in a hierarchy of increasing certainty. Facts are the world's data. Theories are structures of ideas that explain and interpret facts. Facts don't go away when scientists debate rival theories to explain them. Einstein's theory of gravitation replaced Newton's in this century, but apples didn't suspend themselves in midair pending the outcome. And humans evolved from ape-like ancestors, whether they did so by Darwin's proposed mechanism or by some other yet to be discovered. Moreover, fact doesn't mean absolute certainty. There ain't no such animal in an exciting and complex world. The article continues. The final proofs of logic and mathematics flow deductively from stated premises and achieve certainty only because they are not about the empirical world. Evolutionists make no claim for perpetual truth, though creationists often do, and then they attack us falsely for a style of argument that they themselves favor. In fact, in science, fact can only mean confirmed to such a degree that it would be perverse to withhold provisional consent. I suppose that apples might start to rise tomorrow, but the possibility does not merit equal time in physics classrooms. Evolutionists have been very clear about this distinction of fact and theory from the very beginning, if only because we have always acknowledged how far we are from completely understanding the mechanisms, the theory by which evolution, fact, occurred. Darwin continually emphasized the difference between his two great and separate accomplishments, establishing the fact of evolution and proposing a theory, natural selection, to explain the mechanism of evolution. Stephen J. Gould, Evolution as Fact and Theory in Discover of May 1981. I saw part of your speech to the Texas Board of Education you said outright, evolution is a fact. Those are pretty ballsy words. You want to back those up? Evolution's a fact? What do you mean? <laughs> well, in the same sense that uh, while we have atomic theory, there is no doubt that there are atoms. And even when we couldn't photograph atoms before, we could photograph atoms. We can still prove that they exist. You don't have to be able to see something or smell it or touch it. I mean, it can exist outside of your own senses, but there has to be a way to identify it. everything that really exists has properties. And by those properties, we can identify and confirm and validate whether or not these things exist. And even though evolution you know, takes a great deal of time, you can observe it, you can calculate its movements, and you can, and you can note certain passages that actually can occur in real time. Speciation is one of those where we've actually seen it in real time, and that is the uh, base category of macroevolution. So everybody tells you that there's never been any observed instances of macroevolution. Yes, there have. There have been dozens of them. There have even been instances where 
single-celled organisms become multicellular organisms under direct observation in controlled conditions. When they talk about how science is uncertain, so should religion be. Uh, because, again, you're talking about speculation, you're talking about interpretations, you're talking about 12 different people having 12 completely different opinions and all of them saying that theirs is absolute fact and none of them can verify anything that they believe. Nobody can show that what they believe is actually true. And then you get the guy who's promoting science, and yeah, he can. He can show what is really true. And when I listed at the end of that video, when I listed all these different facts of evolution, these are things that we can demonstrate are actually are true. And I would put to any number of people promoting a given religion as the one true one, what can you show that shows that your religion, any aspect of your belief, is actually knowledge and not just belief? Because the difference between belief and knowledge, of course, is that knowledge is measurable. It's demonstrable. It's testable with measurable accuracy. You can, you can show what you know, whereas belief doesn't have that requirement. I don't want to say your background was religious, Aaron, but you dabbled. You, you stuck your, your toe in, in a whole lot of different pools. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> when I heard your speech at Free OK, I was like, this guy has definitely sampled at the buffet of belief and tried a whole bunch of different stuff. And were, would you say you were religious at any one time or was it more like you were just experimenting to see what was out there? The big thing that I missed of religion that a lot of other people got was in devoting my life to it. Now, there were things that I believed were likely true based on the information that I gathered it, but I never committed. I never started declaring that what I believe was the truth. Well, actually, I think at one point that I did, and it gave me a bad taste in my mouth as soon as I said it. I think I was 19, and it didn't take long for me to realize that what I thought was absolute truth was uh, absolute hooey. Well, come on. What were you doing? I mean, you, I heard you talk about astral projection. You guys were, what, hallucinating about orbs of light appearing in a uh, some sort of, it wasn't a seance. I mean, paint a picture for me. What kind of stuff were you into? Well, in meditation, when you're trying to push the boundaries of your perception, you can use ambiance, mood, uh, drugs help, although that was never my way. Okay. It's just what, just what he heard, folks. It's just what he heard. <laughs> You know, a lot of people, all these different religions, you know, some of them will use peyote, some of them will use hemp, some of them will use other things, and of course wine and, and all this. But and, and while a lot of people will promote that, that was never my way, that was never my method. Firelight, music, drums, um, any number of things, candles, for example. There's so many different things that can put you into a mood or build up a, a build up a spirit. I mean, if you've ever been to those speak in tongues churches, that's exactly what you're watching. You're watching people get psyched up, and you are, in a, in a sense, you're 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 criticized as as not being able to validate yourself if you're not able to force or invoke a hallucination. If you're not able to speak in tongues, then there's something wrong with you. You're supposed to be able to do this. You're supposed to be able to achieve this level of laughably they call it perception which of course is not it's manufactured it's manufactured in your own mind and i've experienced this to the point that i remember seeing these fantastic things and believing that i was really seeing them and at some point later in life when every other associated belief that went along with that all one by one proved to be untrue that left me with looking at these events that if every supportive and every peripheral aspect of that belief are all wrong, then did I really see these things? Did I really feel and experience these things? And it became a point where, I, I mean, I still remember them vividly. It seemed so real. But I had to realize that I could have manufactured that whole thing. I was reading an article about about perception versus reality and how memories don't actually embed themselves in your brain right away. You know, that's why people who have uh, head trauma will often lose short term memory because the memory has not had time to, for lack of a better way of saying it, you haven't had a chance to really imprint. And 
It, there's so much subjection. There's so many different elements that can tamper with how you perceive something that if someone comes up to you and says, I had a personal experience, I was on my deathbed, I floated over my uh, my bed, I, I heard what the doctor said, I saw my own face, you can't tell me I did, didn't happen. Personal experience is like eyewitness testimony. It's certainly unreliable. Exactly. I mean, because... Yeah, how many episodes of Star Trek do you have to watch, or how many how many movies of Star Wars do you have to see before you see what demonstrable feats are like? I mean, yeah, if you encounter a Jedi and he tells you that he can do all of these things, you just have to believe that he does because he's not going to demonstrate them, or that he remembers having done these things but he can't show you. Well, that's quite a bit different than the movie. Those guys actually did stuff, and you saw it. And when Spock put his fingers on your on the side of your head, he's able to read your mind, and he's able to prove that he can actually do it. And and all these other characters that had all these mental powers, they were actually able to demonstrate them and show that they could really do the things that they were saying. And they didn't have to be in the right mood, and the stars didn't have to be in the right place, and you didn't have to achieve a certain aura or chi. All of these other conditions are simply aspects of where, of where you're trying to create a hallucination in your own mind, whether you realize that or not. And the thing that got to me was that as an adept at this sort of practice, I realized at one point that I was able to create images, scenarios that people would, would experience, and it was just a matter of coaxing them into experiencing this and it had to be something that they already believed. That was the amusing thing. I could not show a Christian Krishna, for example. But I, if it was something you already bought into, I could enhance that, and I could make it real for you. And then I realized how like an illusion that was. And in realizing that it was an illusion that I was creating, I realized that I could be inverting this. I could be doing it to myself. And it wasn't a moment later that I realized I was. And that all of the great adept, all of the things that I was demonstrating for other people that were that were part of that same, oh, I don't know what you would call it, it's not necessarily a belief system. I mean, it was just people that wanted to believe in woo-woo, you know, and they, they want to believe they're special. They want to believe they have powers. And everybody that, that attached themselves to this kind of genre will say, Everything that I was demonstrating for them, I realized was an illusion that I was creating for my own benefit as much as for theirs. I'm glad I'm not the only one who invokes uh, Star Trek as uh, examples in conversation. You realize you and I are, I mean, you realize Shatner and Nimoy are 80, like 81 years old. You realize that we are in the era where the icons of our youth are in the winter the extreme winter of their lives and we're about to see them start to go you know i'm i'm sorry folks when shatner goes it's going to be a dark dark day in this house i've always been a fan of the classic i'm more impressed with them now than i were then and i'll tell you why because something and i don't remember where i where i got this from spock i'm i'm almost certain that he said the the, the same things but i remember reading specifically from shatner where he was talking about in these advanced years, that once upon a time he was Jewish, and once upon a time he had theistic beliefs. And I remember when he, he wrote one of the Star Treks, and it was like the, the quest for God thing, yeah. and it was it was so annoying. But he eventually let go of that, and he did so when it is when it requires the most bravery to do. I believe he was in his 60s or so, and he he said he was he's getting up in age and and all of this and that's and and that he realized that it just there wasn't any substance to this belief. Believing something because you want to believe it does not make it true. It means that you're trying to protect yourself from the inevitable. Is not you you are not facing reality. And Shatner said, "I wish I could remember how he said it, but it was it was." Eloquent. Well, Gene Roddenberry, the creator, not to geek out here for too long, but the creator of Star Trek was one of the first openly atheist Hollywood types, movie producer, TV producer types that I had really heard. I I, I remember I was reading something in an interview or I don't know, it was years, decades ago. And he was uh, he was adamantly 
opposed to the idea of God. It's something about how human beings are revolving beyond their need for gods, competent to take responsibility for their own actions. Now, I was still a believer at the time and really immersed in the faith. And I remember it just hit me like a hammer. I was like, oh, geez, you know, I hope one day he I hope one day he accepts Jesus Christ as his personal saviors. You know, I mean, that's not how I said it, but but that's the mindset. You think, oh, man, the poor guys he did. And I was I never occurred to me to actually explore the idea of human beings taking responsibility for their own actions. And, you know, if you look at the old track, uh, you know, 19, what, 66, 67, 68, whenever, there's a lot of humanist type stuff in there. Yeah, but not uh, enough, I'm sorry to say. You remember that one where they did the uh, the Greek gods? I think it was Apollo. It, you have Gene Roddenberry, who's, who's still alive, and he's, he's involved in the show, and it's, it's his biggest success of his life, and yet he has to cower and cater to people who can't break through that last barrier because they're showing how fake – all the old pagan gods are, and the, and the multitude in, in any pantheon of polytheism, oh, that's obviously fake. But when you have Spock and Kirk and everything, they're facing Apollo, and Kirk says, we have advanced beyond you know, a multitude of gods. And then he adds the statement, and I, I just wonder what the background arguments were that led to this line being written into the script. We find the one sufficient. So somebody wrote in when he's he's criticizing you know saying that, that humans have evolved past the need for God. Somebody insists that they get that line back in there. Are you a total nerd or or what? I mean I mean talk to me about your personal life a little bit. Do you are you a, are you do do you do D and D? Do you, I mean I don't know if that's nerd or not, but I mean do you follow sci fi? Do you read fiction? I mean what what do you do? I know you got a family. Yeah, one of the few books I've read is The Hitchhiker's Guide. Yes. I, I've watched a lot of a lot of a lot of British uh, comedies. Yes, I would definitely call myself a nerd in the respect that if I, I mean, I've watched Big Bang Theory, and there was that episode where where this guy has to he's trying to to hit on this girl, and they're having a football party, and so he has to have somebody tell him what football is so that he can pretend that he's interested in it. And I remember shocking both of my brothers when I told them that I have never watched a football game in my life. <laughs> if football is on TV, it may as well be in, you know, in the old TVs when you could change between stations, you would get the static. That is more interesting to me because at least I know that's coming from Jupiter. <laughs> Are you a reader? How do you learn? I know that you went back to school. I know that you became a sponge of information, scientific information. You got hungry, right? I mean, let's go back in time for just a second. You were at one point a tattoo artist. Is that right? Yes. Really good work if you can get it. Yes. Yeah. So how long is, did that go on? We talking years or? Uh... Yes. And for a, for a time, I, it was a really sweet gig because uh, I I lived in a place where I mean it was a military base not far away so I mean I always had steady business but most of my business I'm happy to say was girls from 18 to 24 years old and most of them models of one type or another or dancers and they all wanted tattoos they could hide regardless of what they were wearing. <laughs> Um, my heart breaks. How did you get through it, man? And try to imagine a work day. You know, I mean, I, at one point my wife comes home and there's this blonde lying across the table, one leg over my shoulder as I'm trying to, to tattoo a lion lying in the grass. And I don't have to tattoo the grass. Hi, honey. <laughs> 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 a bunch of guys, I mean, all of them wearing leather jackets, a whole bunch of motorcycles pull up at the house at the same time. All these guys walk in, there's this girl on the table, I'm doing this tattoo, and everybody's like, wow, that's really good work, man. Are you a freehand artist on top of that? Is that did they go hand in hand? I, I was. I was for a while, yeah. I haven't now, I haven't been able to do any painting, sculpting, drawing, or any of that for, for quite a while because I don't have time. Most people I know who have an artistic penchant of some kind, I mean, they, they don't, if they repress it because life kicks in, they can't keep it buried for long. Certainly you think, I got to get out and paint something, sculpt something, draw something. You got to let it out. I mean, how do you how do you release? How do you relax? When I started doing videos, it was a new, uh, new method of artwork, um, and, I, and I loved creating. Again, it was a different kind of creation. 
but I tried sculpting, I tried painting and drawing and tattooing and all of this, and I I just loved that. So now I have a format where I can create things and and do interesting visual effects or what have you, and and I got into it. They had great fun. You've done, is it a 15 video series, The Foundational Falsehoods of Creationism? Yes. And I, I should have done a 16th one for the flood, but I knew the flood would be a half a dozen different videos on its own. Give me some highlights. Is it that you heard so many arguments for so long with such repetition that you finally just said, I've, I'm going to just lay this out point by point, bullet by bullet? What what motivated you? And, and give me some highlights from the series. Well, whenever you get into these discussions, and, and they're usually people with little short messages and these little uh, 500 character blocks in so many different you know media that you go to, you have limited spaces where you can type, and they always say the same things. I mean, to everybody that I talk to, when they say you can't prove evolution, they go right away into cosmology. They go right away into into the origin of life. They have no idea what evolution actually means. They've jumbled everything together so that if evolution is true, that means you have to disprove the existence of God, you have to prove cosmology, you have to, all of that, what they call evolutionism, that whole, you know, where evolution is supposed to be responsible for the origin of everything somehow, that became the sixth foundational falsehood of creationism. That comes up every, every everybody that I talk to that doesn't know what they're talking about, that goes to there. Uh, they all want to argue, like, uh, it, this one girl that, that told me that I could never prove evolutionism because in order to prove that evolution happened, I had to disprove the existence of God, and because that's the first foundational falsehood of creationism, that you have to reject God to accept science. Well, there are many creationists now, like Francis Collins. He's an evangelical Christian. He embraces evolution. Of course, they always throw in the caveat that, well, it's guided evolution. God spun it into motion. It's part of his grand design, right? Well, you have to remember there is a distinction between creationists and Christians, because a creationist is a religious extremist who not only rejects evolution specifically, but in a more general sense, rejects scientific methodology, all of them. Methodological naturalism is the thing they're really after, because they don't want us, they don't want to rely on scientific explanations. And this goes to a point that I was going to bring up earlier when they talk about how science is uncertain about things, and religion asserts you know, this absolute knowledge. The fact is that everything that has ever been explained was explained by science. And the only way to improve your perspective is to find out what's wrong with your current perspective and correct it. And so science improves, it becomes more accurate all the time. Whereas with religion, you get more and more denominations believing more and more diversely variant things because of no idea. They're making it up as they go along and there's no measure. Uh, One guy was arguing with me a week or so ago that he could believe, uh, he he could hold any number of beliefs that were partially true or or maybe truer than what they were, or maybe not quite so true. How would you know? How would you take a religious belief and verify whether it is truer than what you believed last week? There's no way to measure the accuracy of a religious belief. There's no way to verify that any of it is true at all. There's no way to distinguish your deeply held beliefs from the illusions of delusion. You can't show me that it is even real. And then somebody else got ma- got angry with me over a, a debate on, on their theology, saying that I was making things up. My accusation was, of course, that he was making things up, that the whole of it was made up. You said something when we spoke last year on our very first podcast that I have seen manifest in probably, I'm guessing, 90% plus of the conversation slash debates I have had with people who are proponents of the Christian religion, the religion that I left. And what happens is you had said that you were speaking to someone and you laid out specific bullet points of how they were factually wrong. Essentially, you disproved the argument dispassionately, right? You didn't go in, you didn't beat him over the head, you didn't shout at him, you'd, it wasn't a personal thing, you just went in and said, here's the evidence. And when the evidence was presented, you mentioned the mannequin stare, and then the response, which was essentially chanting mantras. They were sending, they were not receiving. Everywhere I go, 
almost every instance I have where I am dealing with someone who believes in a six-day creation, they believe that the entire earth was flooded, and one guy with a floating zoo saved eight people who committed incest to repopulate the earth with 5,000 ethnic groups over 4,000 years. They believe in zombies and curses and unicorns and leviathons and, and supermen who gain strength from their hair and every other thing posited in the Bible. And they look at me and, and like I'm nuts. They absolutely are not receiving. Do you ever get through? Do you ever have success? It would be. Yeah, I do get I do get success. Yes. Um, it, it happens with actually a surprising frequency. I get a lot of email and I'm surprised at the amount of it that is overwhelmingly positive. Now, is it that you planted a seed and then they came back to you after they've had a chance to calm down and digest and then then they then doubt, you know, doubt often will take time. Or do, is it right then they say, hey, man, that's a great that's a great point. <laughs> Does that ever happen? <laughs> I, I, I can tell you from experience. No, uh, nobody ever just wakes up from that overnight. It takes time because it is so deep seated. And it has to fester and mull around in your mind until it until you you realize, it, you know, inwardly first that there was a there, there was a valid point there. Do people see your passion for science and tell you that it made them interested? That you know, wow! I, I now I'm passionate too. Now I'm hungry for information. Do you get emails and and input like that? I get emails from people, and again, this is. This is a number of people. I mean, maybe maybe a dozen or so in the last few months that have told me that they've returned to school or that they've changed their 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 course plan or their major based on something that was inspired in some point by what I had said in my videos. And it's and I'm not I'm not trying to deconvert people necessarily. I mean, if I had one single message, it, it would be that that when religion asserts knowledge of things you can't actually know and can't honestly claim knowledge of, then it is dishonest. And that it is vastly more honest to declare uncertainty and then to try to correct your perspective and find a way to figure out which is the truer belief. Do people ever say that uh, science is your religion, that your science is just another religion? Yeah, that's the fifth foundational false of the creation. <laughs> and your response is what? What do you say? Every, well, you first, you have to have a definition, and I've made sure that I've provided definitions for, for every term that I use, and I try to verify that those definitions are applicable uh, to the best that I can, I mean, because I'm always challenged on the same things again and again. Religion is not just anything you believe. People will want to tell me that, that stamp collecting is a religion, not stamp collecting is a religion, football is a religion, any number of anything that you're passionate about, people will say is a religion. And I have to say, no, everything that is universally accepted by everyone as a religion holds certain things in common. If you're going to classify an entire category, then you have to take everything that is universally accepted in that category, list all their common traits, shared by all of them, and there's where your definition comes from. And religions, so far as I can tell, everyone I've analyzed, including Buddhism, because a lot of Buddhists will deny this, but, but I've gotten them to, to concede on this point in the temple, and they were not happy with me. Um, all religion is a faith-based belief uh, in the in it, that it that posits some form of continuation, posthumous continuation of self. It has to have faith, and it does. It says something about some aspect of you surviving death. Now, when I went to the Theravada temple, as I know a lot of people will say that you know Buddhism is this great exception to that, and I've heard of you know a couple of others where people say that this is an exception. Also, the same kind of thing applies. I went to the Theravada temple and I listened to them, to them talk for a long time, and I tried to give them the definition of evolution, and they they describe how how they're different from this, and they they you know they don't have a god, for example, in their religion. I said, well, that's true. You don't have to have a god. Many religions don't, but the way that these people were describing their God was that it was an immortal being that could hear prayer and perform miracles. Now, I know that this Theravada temple here in Dallas, Texas, does not speak for everyone, but that's a God. 
you're immortal, you perform miracles, you answer prayers, that's a deity by definition. And then they, they talk about they don't believe in self. Well, the, the same guy that tells me that they have no belief in self and they don't believe in reincarnation and they don't believe you can be reborn because they said you have never been born to, be, to begin with, I contested him and I said, well, I bet everybody in this room has a birth certificate to start with. And then later in the conversation, he said, and this was his exact sentence, you may continue as a ghost for a while before, and I don't remember exactly how he phrased, you know, the, the next incarnation or what have you. He didn't use those words, but he did say, you might be a ghost for a while. That is a continuation of self. You is a word that applies to self. You continue past your death. And I said, there, you've identified yourself as a religion. He was very angry with me, well, but he didn't have anything to say. It's, I guess that's better than the mannequin, the mannequin stare and the mantras. At least it's, you know, you got something fresh. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, and it, it may be a bit of a trick to piss off Buddhists. That was, <laughs> that was not my, my intention. Indiana is considering a bill to allow creationism to be taught in public schools. Unbelievable. This is a fight that you have been fighting on the order of years in Texas. I think one of the problems is is that it's never had a chance to be implemented and this might be it. If there's a if there's a final death knell for creationism, it's when somebody actually has to teach it. Because that's where the big failure comes from. Remember well, I said science Every explanation that's ever been provided has been provided by science. If you're going to teach something, you have to be able to teach that it is fact. You have to be able to verify that it is true. Creationism doesn't have any of that. Creationism is going to have people just talking out of their ass, making up stuff on the, on the whim. No idea. Well, if they start with Christian, the Christian creation story, then the door must open for every other religion's creation story as well, if they're all on equal footing with a scientific explanation, right? Yeah. Uh, the Hubble constant and the uh, building blocks of all life came from the stars and all of this stuff that we have been, you know, all, all of scientific discovery. If you include creationism, now you essentially have to roll out the red carpet for every other creation theory, religious theory, story, whatever fantasy that's out there. It'll be chaos. Well, you know, remember, I told you at the beginning of this conversation that they want to create some illusion of equality and the inequity the reality of the situation will never be so evident as when they actually have to teach it in class, when they can show how to verify and how to demonstrate evolution, when they can show how to measure evolution, they can show all the facts for evolution. Then what do we have for creationism? Same book of fables we read last week. And then just for just for giggles, we should bring in a new book of fables. Uh, this one talks about how a boy accidentally got his head cut off, and uh, it was a god, and so he didn't die. So they wanted him to stay alive, but they didn't know how to put his head back on. So they, they put an elephant's head on him, and there you get Ganesha. Right, and then you have an army of monkeys that are going to go uh, against some devil on some island, Sri Lanka. And so all these monkeys under Hanuman, the leader of the monkeys, build a great bridge made out of stones. And all these monkeys run out and bury stones out in the water, and they build a bridge completely out of stone all the way from India to Sri Lanka. And that bridge is still there, and you can see it from satellite photographs. I would love to show how deep religious beliefs make plausible the most ridiculous story if you've heard it all your life and the people who embrace one creation tale that involves the six days two naked people an enchanted tree a talking snake forbidden fruit they're the ones who will look across the way at somebody else's equally ridiculous creation story and say that's the stupidest thing i've ever heard in my life not realizing I was guilty for a lot of years. I see so much that relates back to geography and family, geography and culture, how what you were indoctrinated with, the dearth of critical thinking skills. Religion kills curiosity. When you start with God did it, they just throw cold water on the, the natural innate curiosity that you have growing up to find out how it really works. And one of the things that, and, and I'm sure you're aware of this, I mean, you, you ex-religious people are very much like ex-smokers in that, you know, you, you are more anti-smoking than if you were always a non-smoker, okay? So people were that were never religious, and this is most atheists, I think they were never religious, and so many of them, I think, were not 
raised in Texas or Oklahoma where we were inundated and surrounded by all these people that are trying to force their beliefs on us. If you lived in a more moderate place, then you didn't have that thrust upon you and you just wouldn't care. Most atheists are so apathetic to religion, they don't even realize they are atheists. And I think that's a great deal of the, of the voting populace don't even recognize themselves as that. I have met atheist Hindu who they're culturally Hindu in the same sense that, uh, that, that some Jews are culturally Jewish, even though they don't believe in a God. I was asking this one girl about uh, elements of the Mahabharata because I was looking for a scriptural reference. And she was the only Hindu I knew, and she interrupted me. And she goes, I am Hindu because my parents are Hindu, not because I believe this. So she she embraced the culture, but not, not the, the actual and belief she system. she didn't realize that if she didn't genuinely buy that as true, that that meant that she wasn't really Hindu, not not in a religious sense. There's a difference between cultural belief, and it's not it's not a belief. It's, you know, you're, you're culturally Jewish, you're culturally Hindu. A lot of Christians are culturally Christian, have no idea what the Bible actually says. I have always been told that I'm obsessed. Why start a website? You know, why Why make videos? Why go out and speak to hundreds of people? What's the matter with you? Why can't you just let people live? Sure, you were a Christian for 30 years, fine. But why are you so obsessed? I mean, he talks about the people who were ex-believers being so passionate, you know, like the, the non-smoking advocates. You know, Matt Dillahunty was going to be a preacher. And look at the guy. I mean, he's compelled. It's like when you have inside knowledge of something. So you see it from the inside out, and, and you can't wait. You see the movie The Insider, right? Russell Crowe, Al Pacino. Terrific movie, by the way. The guy's got inside information, something the public needs to know. The consequences are major, major. And yet, despite the fact that it throws his family into turmoil, it his finances, his reputation, you know, we were talking about, it was unbelievable. He had to get it out. He couldn't sit still. He couldn't sit on it. That's exactly how I feel. It's exactly how I feel. Can I have more things with you just, just off the top? Yeah, please do. When I called into your show the other day and you were talking about Harry Potter being of the devil, I wanted to get into the story and I didn't get a chance to, to get into it. And it would have monopolized them. But now is my time. <laughs> yeah, take it. Go for it. We were talking about, you know, how I used to be into this uh, neo-pagan sort of a thing, which um, I was thinking more along the lines of psionics and that sort of thing. But it, it was something that it, other belief systems completely did not tolerate, except, of course, for pagans. And so I found myself associating with a lot of Wiccan and Druids and people of that sort. And this is this is going back, you know, a quarter of a century now. But once upon a time, I was in uh, San Antonio. Uh, with a group called the Forge Coven. And there was this woman at the time that was uh, spreading all kinds of propaganda about anybody that had, you know, guys that had long hair and earrings or people that wore dark clothing and had candles or if they had, you know, medieval implements or, med or interest in medieval things and that sort of thing. Then they were all, you know, of the devil and they were um, picketing a radio station because it was Magic 105 and had a big dragon on it and all that sort of thing. Well, I, I knew... Uh, a couple that were that claimed to be druidic, and uh, this group of anti-magic, anti-witch people, um, obviously a Christian group, uh, found their addresses. And uh, th this woman steps out on her front porch, and they had spilled motor oil all over the entire front porch and erected a banner 12 foot long across her front yard that said, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Just to give you an idea of the atmosphere in Texas for people that, that were not Christian, you know, and they had, they had beliefs that challenged Christianity. At that time, nobody was atheist. You know, at that time, if you weren't Christian, you know, if you, if you didn't have, if you didn't embrace a approved belief system, then that meant you were a satanic. So everything was of the devil, including, you know, music and Harry Potter and Dungeons and Dragons and all that. And... One of the, the high priest of the Forge Coven, uh, his son turned 13 years old and asked for his own pentacle. 
And uh, the guy described, you know, what, how people react when they see a pentacle. Nobody knows what it means, et cetera. They're going to jump to the wrong conclusions, but the boy says he's going to be responsible about it. They let the boy wear a pentacle, so he's part of the family religion. And this is his cultural identity as well. You know, just like with any other, you know, cultural religious attachment. So this boy is on his way to school wearing his pentacle, and another child from the same school. Now, remember, these are people I knew. Another child from the same school shot him dead in the street. And he cited, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live as his legal defense, thinking that that justified his actions. How old was he? Was he a teenager? Thirteen. I'm surrounded by believers. I, I don't know anybody in the mainstream church who goes, who would ever go to that extreme. I mean, they might shun you. Just as no. I said that most atheists are completely apathetic. Most Christians are in some manner equally so. You can't make most Christians watch the Trinity Broadcast Channel. You can't make them listen to anything Pat Robertson says. They'll send him money, but they won't listen to him speak because everything he says is repugnant. Most Christians that I have met have never heard of a chick tract. I think every atheist knows what those insidious comic books are, but most Christians do not. And they and because they are the silent majority in this country, they allow the lunatic fringe to guide them with no controls, because you can't make them accept that, okay, these radical people that are saying objectionable things are part of my religion. They have a way of distancing. They're, they're not true, whatever, if they listen to them at all. And most of the time, they don't want to challenge their belief. They don't want to have controversy attached to Christianity. They are good Christians. I've always had the word good and Christian stuck together, and that's the way they think it is. And they're not going to let that be challenged by any reality. Speaking of people who may be detached from reality, I have to bring up Rick Perry, your illustrious governor down there in Texas. Now, the 2012 election has been a real headache for all of us. I mean, we look, it's not even February yet. And I'm like, how much more of this do we have to put up with? I'm hitting it from both sides. I, I, I can't stand any candidate, incumbent or running, right? I just can't stand any of them. But I, I look at the political process now, and I think I can't ever remember a time where it was as overtly evangelical as it is now, where they are essentially promoting their faith on the taxpayer dime as a national religion. I, I can't ever remember being at this intense. Can you? It's hard for me to imagine, and I did a video about this recently where I complained about every political candidate and the way they were selling the religion, and like you said, including the, the incumbent. Yeah. And it's not it's not just that the religious that I'm upset about. It's, it's every other associated thing that I'm upset about. I've ne never had such a choice of bad before. I mean, when you have Newt Gingrich, who says that he fears that his grandchildren will grow up in a atheist country that is ruled by radical Islamists, how the hell does that even make sense? Rick Santorum, who, who argues that it, you know, if science points to the fact that science doesn't answer all these questions, then why don't we pursue that? Again, science doesn't answer all the questions. Religion answers none of them. Science has some answers that it has gotten right, and we can prove that it has gotten right. Religion, no, nothing. Religion has never gotten anything right that has gotten a heck of a lot wrong. That's why I say science doesn't know everything. Religion doesn't know anything. And you have a governor who essentially is holding, well, holding, at least attending very public prayer rallies, who is integrating God and his faith and, and essentially speaking out about gays in the military in his ad, which was immediately parodied across YouTube. And some very, very funny parodies are out there. If you haven't had a chance, just Google Rick Perry. And this is the guy that when, when he realized, he, he denies climate change. He denies, as so many of them do, that 
humans can impact the environment by overpolluting, by being irresponsible with their resources, by by proliferating like rabbits and chewing up all the consumables. Because this is a consumer nation. That's what they want to produce. They, they don't want us to be producers. They don't want us to be wise. They want us to be gullible sheep, and they don't want us to be educated. They want us. They, they certainly don't want us to 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 practice, you know, safe sex and controlled breeding techniques. No, they want as many rabbits out there as they possibly can to consume, consume, consume. And they don't have to be responsible for what happens to the environment because Jesus is going to come back and burn everything anyway. So you have people that are denying their responsibility for what they're doing to the planet. They don't have to worry about it because these are the last days, they hope, they hope, they hope, because otherwise they're going to have everything completely screwed up and they're not going to, they will not be responsible for what they did and they will never, ever admit when they're wrong. So you have Rick Perry up there realizing that there's a terrible drought, and he's not going to acknowledge that the climate is definitely different than it was. But he's going to say, let's pray to make it better. So we all pray for rain. On his order, he has everybody in Texas pray for rain, and finally did rain 15 months later. The idea of the Constitution being so overtly sort of spat upon, all presidents and, and political Pez heads are always saying, God bless America. I mean, whatever, whatever. All right. But it's everywhere. It's coming out of the mouths of everyone. And you spoke about a public of outward Christians. They speak the words, God is love. They have the bumper stickers. They have the fish on their car. They keep a Bible gathering dust on the nightstand. They go to church a few times a month. But they are disconnected from their own book and to a great degree from the political process. What they hear is someone goes out and invokes God at a press conference and they go, oh, he's a good man. We need a good Christian man in there to return our nation to its roots. The fact that they are voting in this way out of sheer ignorance is extremely scary. And the fact that there are certain negative statistics that correlate with deeply held religious beliefs, one of them being child abuse, child molestation, uh, you know, know, child rape, child homicide, all being strongly linked to deep religion. And the more religious they are, the more criminal they are statistically. I mean, right now we've got somebody coming into Texas who's being paid for and hosted by evangelical ministries in Houston. They want this woman, Ukpabio, coming from, I think it's Nigeria, to preach her gospel of witch hunting. This is a woman who is responsible for the murder of 15,000 children. Because for some reason, all the witches she ever finds are always children. And the symptoms that she identifies as being indicative of witchcraft are strangely similar to the symptoms of childhood leukemia and other sort of illnesses. And she spills uh, spills acid on their faces or she throws them into pits and then dumps fiery debris on top of them. And these are the ways that she exorcises them. And one of her associates in this type of mind-bending distortion uh, did a laying on of hands for Sarah Palin when she was running for vice president. And now they want this woman to come to Texas to preach, and they're paying for her. This is when it gets super scary. And you're going to tell me, go ahead, tell me something about abortion again, really. Stem cell research should be considered murder. And But as long as they're already born, then you can do whatever the hell you want to them, apparently. Before I go to the switchboard, I, I want to uh, offer my condolences for what they're worth on the death of your, of your granddaughter. I'm sure it's a sensitive issue. Do you mind speaking about it for just a moment? Only, only for a moment, because this is something that my daughter and I deal with this by, honestly, by not letting ourselves think about this. Um, but I, I did want to point out one thing. Um, the, the video that I did on that, did you recognize it at the very end? I did not. What happened? I was on the phone when my granddaughter said bye-bye and left. To watch that video again, I'm on the phone with you. It was the first show we did. I had no idea. I know it was 
a very, very difficult thing. And and you did a video. People can now see that, right, where you were actually took a moment. You rode the motorcycle. You were in front of the children's hospital and you spoke very transparently about about this beautiful young girl and her life, her much too short life, her, her death. And you just painted a, a picture of words about her. That video is still available for anybody who wants to go to your channel and and sort of absorb that. Is that right? Right. We did a podcast last year about grief. And the thing I took out most was that no afterlife is required for a life to be precious. And sometimes I feel like the words that we say are so often useless. But for what it's worth, I know an entire community of people really had their hearts going out to you and continue to. Uh, let me uh, let me actually go and talk to some of our people here very quickly. I, uh, I'm so sorry it's taken me an hour to do so. 803 has been on hold for one hour. What's your name? Hey, my name's Autumn. I appreciate your patience. Talk to me. What do you have for us today? I live in South Carolina, and that's like really on the fringe when it comes to being like Alabama, Texas, Mississippi. But um, the people I associate with are all in the top of the class. My friends are like the sixth in the class and fifth in the class and eighth in the class. And we will have discussions about how we will encounter the folks that are hillbilly-ish and, you know, live in the shacks that are around our town in the underdeveloped areas and how they'll completely deny evolution and how we have to go in our textbook and show them the whole chapter of where this is the proof about evolution. Yeah, and, and they've, they've never, they, they still don't grasp the, the first thing you might want to say about it because they've been conditioned from so early on. And they have an entire complex mythology built on top of it. And in order for you to get one concept over to them, you first have to refute and destroy everything they already believe because it's this huge network in their minds. What I will say is that one of the kids that was in my biology class when we were actually going over this, is his name was actually Christian, um, but he would go on and on and on about this stuff and the teacher had to, you know, calm him down. But, you know, within further uh, investigation into this kid's personal life, turns out he's into one of the more extreme evangelical churches, which do the speaking in tongues stuff. Yeah. What's the atmosphere like in South Carolina? Or is it hostile toward atheists? Are you out? Do you tell people you don't believe? What it really comes down to is that uh, if people are going to know, there's going to be some people who would really do harm to you or act like they would because, you know, they're so good Christian folks. But... Uh, like my friends aren't as extreme that you got to find out who are the people that it's okay to talk to because otherwise these are the people with the access to the guns and these are the people who could cause some harm to you if they so choose autumn thank you so much for the call and for your patience and i know aaron appreciates your support and you take care of yourself okay you too aaron do you ever uh, you ever worry about in texas you ever worry about somebody showing up on your front door with a weapon of some kind i mean yeah you're you are visible you are out you are adamant you are a warrior for uh, essentially against superstition you ever think about some half-cocked dude showing up on your door i i'm almost never recognized on the street which i can't understand i guess i just blend into the crowd of every other long-haired sasquatch with a chinese fu manchu i mean just like <laughs> you are the most you are this big imposing character and yet you are the most gentle easy going terrific guy there's something about you you're the kind of guy i could just hang out with but at any moment i fear you just kick my ass <laughs> you know no no i got i got to tell you that that one of the things that bothered me growing up is the way that people react you know, when, when people are reactionary, and it was always indicative, in my mind, it was always indicative of a low intelligence. If you're quick to anger, then you're low of intellect. And I believe Darwin said something very, very like that. Uh, is one, one of my favorite quotes from him, which strangely I can't remember at the moment verbatim, but he, he made similar comments, that if, you, if your intelligence is low, that you're going to be quick to anger. And, and that's, 
Yeah, I remember the Blues Brothers. You know how they, these guys weren't ever phased by anything. That that I ad- more admire. I wish there was more of it. I see a lot of vitriol, a lot of anger, a lot of knee jerk, a lot of, man, the Christian community did this to me or the religious community did this to me and I deserve to be filled with rage. And I tend to think that hate's a, a toxin, that it's a poison that can eat away at you. I think anger certainly has its place. Anger can be a great motivator, but... There's an important point here, too. Uh, just as you acknowledge that you were once a believer and all of the great advocates of um, secularism, of rational thinking, or of, of science anymore in this country, they all, most of them, at least, started out as religious believers. So vitriol is never the cure for that situation. And you have to, I encourage everybody to, to recognize when you're talking to a believer, they're not all Ray Comfort. They're not all Kent Hovind. You know, they, they, there are a lot of people who believe what they believe because they've been conditioned to, and they can be convinced, they can be reasoned with, many of them, not all of them. Area code 319, you are on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Thank you so much for your patience. Who's this? Liz. Liz, I'm so glad you called. Thank you for your patience. What do you got for us? Uh, well, you said so much over the course of this hour that initially was like, oh, evolution, yes, because I'm actually an anthropologist. So evolution is actually something that I... I study a lot. But then you brought up Star Trek, and I'm like, oh, I'm from Iowa. Star Trek is kind of my thing. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been so much, because uh, I've been listening the whole hour. And, um, but yeah, I actually, as a, as a elementary school student, I ended up in a private school, mostly because our local public school had really gone downhill in terms of of uh, education and my mom's a teacher and so she was very determined that I got a good education so she ended up sending me to a private school not for the religion at all she never even though she is a very religious woman she, we never went to church when I was growing up and uh, I ended up at the at this private school and in our science classes they would try to keep religion out of the other topics as much as they could even though the textbook was called God's gift of science but they never talked about evolution ever. They were really, really careful. And there was sort of this air that even the name Darwin was evil. And like, if you said it, it was awful. And so there was lots of talk about that show on Nickelodeon, The Wild Thornberries. There was this, a character was named Darwin. And all these kids were like, oh, that's so bad. And so I didn't know anything about the theory of evolution until I got into junior high. And immediately it was like, whoa, this is so much cooler. This makes so much more sense, so much more beautiful to me. And as soon as I could, I ended up going to a, a, a public junior high. And so as soon as I got back into the public school system, I was like, oh, man, no more religion for me. I'm done. And I charged forward and I study uh, human evolution basically now. And it's difficult to have arguments with people who, who always want to, to pull the theory. I was really glad that. You guys are like, well, evolution is just a theory. That argument is so bogus. Well, you're an anthropologist, or are you are you an anthropology major, or are you actually... Um, I just graduated in December, and okay. I'm getting ready to apply for graduate school. All right, well, I'll posit this to both you and Aaron. Somebody comes up and they say, I can't believe that the whole universe and life and creation and the eye and the complexity of our organs and the way we are and everything and the animals and everything happened by chance... Someone says that to you, what do you say back? Uh, It has nothing to do with chance. It has everything to do with certain traits being advantageous and continuing on. And and it's not chance. It's not like it just happened. It's not like the world was all of a sudden, oh, we have all of these complex animals. It took millions of years to get where we are. And to call it chance is to cheapen it, I think. That's my seventh foundational falsehood of creationism, by the way. (laughs) So you hear it a lot. I hear it all the time. They minimize the fact that we're talking about traits that are propagated over time, environmentally propagated, and and, uh, essentially say, well, it just all sort of happened. I mean, you know, a man from a monkey. I mean, how'd that happen? Well, you know, that's always the argument I heard at school. Well, if if humans evolved from monkeys, then why do we still have monkeys? And you know, as a kid, I didn't quite, you know, it seemed like, oh, well, that does kind of make sense. But then I actually learned about what evolution is. And, and what's really frustrating is that people always talk about how Darwin invented evolution. Well, the idea existed way before him. He just came up with the mechanism by which it happened. Mm-hmm. So it's just, you know, you sit there and you're like, well, no, we have a common ancestor with them. And first off, apes aren't monkeys. <laughs> 
<laughs> really, a really important distinction. Monkeys and apes are not, in fact, that close Have you really seen all my videos? <laughs> <laughs> I've, it's kind of, I've only sort of recently sort of been a little bit more vocal about and, and getting more annoyed. Um, something well, awful happened to the me reason I, The reason year. I mentioned that. The, the reason I mention that is because um, I'm, I'm sure, as a, as a if you're a physical anthropologist, then you may be familiar with the uh, uh, paleoanthropologists like Flegel and Delson, and I cite them and a number of other sources in a video wherein I argue that apes actually are monkeys, and so are we currently. Well, there are certain traits that do differentiate monkeys and apes, but but yes, that that is true. No. But- not, not really. You'd, you'd have to watch the. I don't want to try to compress the argument, but um, and it's not like I said. It's not popular, and it, it was not easy for me to accept. I had to have my ass handed to me in a debate that was protracted over three months, and it was, took two months before I came back and told the guy that he was right. Now you know what the religious are doing right now. They're going, man. There's two people who are pro science, and they can't even dis- they can't even agree on whether or not apes and monkeys are the same. <laughs> The glorious thing about science is that it learns from itself and it learns from mistakes. I mean, you can't get everything right the first time. Just to just to clarify, uh, in in the old world monkey set, you have circupeds and hominoids, and the best ape and modern old world monkeys. But what they don't realize is that there's an older set from which apes directly descend, and that's the propliopids. And that propliopus also, in turn, have a common ancestor prior to them, which, uh, oh, gosh, I can't remember that. Parapit- yeah, Parapithecidae. But they are the ancestors for both old world monkeys and new world monkeys. And if you didn't have a common ancestor that was a monkey itself, then you would have polyphyly. And polyphyletic classifications don't work in systematic phylogeny. No, they don't. And it, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if, I mean, we all have what? We have 90 or more percent genetic similarity to most of the apes and fairly close to the monkeys as well. I mean, I'm interested to get to read those arguments now. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if apes were, in fact, more closely related to monkeys than we, than we previously believed. And, and there are many people who argue that humans are just another version of chimpanzee. That we're just I've heard another... that argument, too. I, I, I wouldn't adopt that idea, but I understand what they're saying. Yeah, we, are, we are so similar to them. It's hard to believe, but it's true, that there is less genetic difference between a chimpanzee and a human than there is between some insects. <laughs> that are classified as being similar, but their difference is only their eye color. Are you a physical anthropologist or a cultural anthropologist? I actually am an archaeologist, cultural. but I also study osteology. Okay. So I mostly look at skeletal anatomy. Gotcha. Which, okay, so you're both. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I appreciate your call. Yeah, it's it's great to hear from you. Go kick some ass in the scientific community. I'm excited to, to yeah. know you're out there, okay? Okay, I'll, I'll keep listening. Thank you so much. I don't get to have conversations like that very often in Texas. <laughs> well, it was riveting for me. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding, man. <laughs> no, actually, it's very interesting to me. It really is. Uh, carbon dating. You can't, carbon dating, radiometric dating is totally unreliable. You hear that one quite a bit? You can date fossils. It's totally unreliable. But I don't hear the word radiometric dating. I only ever hear carbon dating, which, of course, is the one method out of, what, 14 that they don't use when they're talking about fossils. And then and then you have, oh, man, I wish I could draw the, the, the names. It's when, uh, but never mind, there's not just radio, car- there's not just radiometric dating methods. There are others. And when you find any one sort that you want to, to, to date an area, a rock formation, you don't ever just use one method. And if you use index fossils, by the way, because you often hear the thing about, you know, how, how scientists use the, the fossils to date the rock and the rock to date the fossil. No, that does not happen. The index fossils will give you an idea of what to expect, but you then have to confirm it. And it's generally concordant, but you can expect that it's not always going to be there because it isn't the trilobite in the rock that tells you how old the rock is. It is the radiometric dating. Area code 336. Thank you for your patience. What's your name? Uh, my name is Pedro. Pedro Acevedo. I'm from High Point, North Carolina. What do you have for us, Pedro? Um, said, uh, I'm a really a big fan of your show and Thank Aaron you. Rod. 
Everyone ride this thing and a big inspiration. You're like Charles Darwin. He, he's for me. <laughs> Rachel Dawkins, you know what I mean? A lot. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, Thank science, you. Science is showing us a, di- a, di- a different way to live. Science is over everything. Religion is just focus on one point. Thank you so much for the call. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. I just wanted to thank Pedro for very kind words. Thank you, sir. 872, thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? I'm Pierce from Chicago, Illinois. Aaron Law, love all of your videos. From, from parodies to your scientific stuff, it's absolutely awesome. And I want to thank you for opening my eyes and letting me see how blatantly false all the Christmas nonsense was. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for the call. Area code 914, you're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Thank you so much for your patience. Who's this? Oh my gosh, it's me. Um, <laughs> hi, uh, this is Kelly. What do you have for us today? I have a story, which recently, for some reason, I mean, listening to your show and stuff, recently bounced back into my memory, and then we go, oh my goodness. I can't believe they allowed this guy to teach. He was a teacher in my fifth grade class, and I remember his name, Mr. Osborne. And I can't believe I still remember his name, but he was teaching us evolution, and I remember him saying very blatantly to me, but let me ask you this. If evolution is fact, then why aren't gorillas still evolving? And I think he meant still evolving into people. And in my eyes now, I'm yeah. like, why would they still allow this guy to teach? Well, we know what effects indoctrination has on children. It does still a thinking mind. Uh, we know that there can be, or at least I, I think there's there's now data um, showing that there's actual measurable brain damage that can result from being forced to believe things on faith that you know are not logically or evidently true. And it does seem to lower the intellect when you're forced into a heavy belief system. And a lot of people tell me that when they they first begin to question their beliefs and start discovering things, that that's when curiosity, in a sense, awakened in them, that they were never curious before. And that was the thing that that Seth said at the beginning that was the most important thing to me, was that that religion kills curiosity. Whenever I was a child and I asked my babysitters, my creationist babysitters, any question because clarification, I want to understand. They want to believe. I want to understand. In order to understand, I have to ask questions. And the answer was, how dare you question? Hey, I'm so glad you called the show. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Or are we good? No, just just the uh, that story. And, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan. So I uh, appreciate you and, and your patience. And thanks for listening. Take care of yourself. One more real fast. 224. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. What's your name? Uh, my name is Kevin. Uh, I want to um, discuss something with Aaron Rao real quick. He said something earlier about the word evolutionism and how it was like necessary for you to disprove God. And I completely agree with him. But I think that this word evolutionism is sort of part of the problem, too, because it's basically a form of propaganda. They're trying to effectively religionize evolution, which is obviously a legitimate scientific discipline. And I think that's what precludes people from investigating it further. Yeah, well, you could refer to the same data as cell theory and population genetics or population mechanics, if you prefer, and people will be completely accepting of it. And they won't make any acknowledgement that there's any reason that they should not believe it. But when you throw out the E word, suddenly the walls go up and, and the hands go over the ears and the eyes seal closed. You wouldn't refer to somebody who accepts gravity as a gravityist or somebody who accepts a, like atomist as an atomist or something. It's completely- well, I, I wonder about that definition because if a cosmologist is somebody who studies cosmology then as a professor, I mean a professional, then an evolutionist must be limited to those people who have a position in paleontology or <laughs> some related field of science in genetics perhaps that deals directly with evolution. But of course, they don't have a definition of that it's just anybody that believes in that religion of evolutionism yeah very kind of you to call thanks for your patience have a great one okay thank you i only have about two and a half minutes Aaron. um the reason rally's coming up in march the single biggest event free thought event pro-science event 
in history ever, as I understand it, on the National Mall in D.C. I'm going, you're going, you're going to be doing your show there. Is that right? I am. I am. I'm going to be doing with uh, Zomgitz Chris and Thunderfoot, DPR Jones coming over from England, uh, as I understand. Uh, Healthy Addict is another uh, YouTuber from the Secular Student Alliance. She's going to be taking part of it. There may be other big-name participants as well. I don't want to mention them until, I know, until we've got confirmation, because I certainly don't want to you know, out anybody or put my foot in my mouth. Well, real fast, though, why is the Reason Rally so important? We were talking about the presidential candidates up to this point, were we not? Yeah, I mean, true. come on, the reason that everybody is so overzealous is because they don't, they're not aware that we are out there. They think that they have to tell people that they believe in possible nonsense for no good reason and that they have to tell people that they hate gays or some other thing, you know, some other group that they hate or that they're against or that they try to isolate and ostracize as much as they can because that's what religion does. And there's a lot of people, a whole lot of people, and we want to show them how many people there are who don't buy into that and who don't want the, our, the religious leaders in the world who want science to point to the fact that science doesn't answer these things and then pursue that science doesn't work. No, idiot. That's why you're not getting this job. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let it out, man. That's what this place is for. ReasonRally.com, we've got people who are booking flights, who are driving cars, carpooling. They're charting, chartering buses. They're coming from all over the nation to converge on the National Mall. Yeah, let me show something else out there. If you go to the Reason Rally uh, uh, website, they also have advertisements for the D.C. Rally Bus. There are chartered buses already designed to go to various cities and pick up people, bus loads of atheists on their way to Washington. When you get to Washington, you've got an option, depending on where you come from, whether you leave the same day or whether you leave the following day. Uh, do contact the D.C. Rally Bus if that is your intended um, method and 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 work that out for yourself and beware because if you're in dc and you walk by r and raw you might not recognize him <laughs> man i gotta run i got 10 seconds on the clock and i hate to go but you've been amazing once again and i will see you in dc in a few weeks brother thank you bye-bye take care follow the thinking atheist on facebook and twitter Watch dozens of original videos on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com